Welcome to the DFS Build. I'm Kevin Roberts, ready to go over this two-game slate at DraftKings for Monday, May 13th. Hopefully you had a good weekend. I took a break as far as producing content over the weekend. I'm here early in the morning to help you get your process started. If I help you in any way, please give this video a like and also consider subscribing to the channel. Both those things help the community grow and help me know that I'm helping you out. All right, let's dive right into it. First game of the night, we got Cavs hosting the Celtics. The Cavs are nine-point home dogs. This game is a 206.5 total. So right away on paper, there's only two games, obviously. So, you know, you're not fully stacking games at this point, you know. But um, you can, and this would be the one I wouldn't stack um, when you look at the spread and the game total and the defensive aptitude and the pace and pretty much everything. Um, but still there are some pieces that we have to look at and you literally have to play at least one player from this game. Uh, starting on the Boston side, Jason Tatum looks totally fine at 9.5 K, uh, coming in with a 51 point fantasy projection at DFS hero, which by the way, you can get 15% off. If you hit our link below, if you're in the search for a lineup tool to use to help you get a takedown. Um, so he looks good. 31% boom rate in there. Uh, the only problem is he's going to be pretty chalky. 44% owned. That is about half the field. Could be even more if you look at single entry tournaments. He had a big game last game. I think he had 62 fantasy points. Um, he had been pretty quiet in this series. Yeah, he did at 62, 33 real points. He'd been really quiet the first two games, just kind of hitting his floor at 45 and 46 fantasy points, which a two game slate isn't going to kill you. Uh, but when you have other dudes at you know expensive salaries crushing, it's not great. Uh, so he showed up in game three for you if you used him. Um, and obviously he can do that anytime out. So 9.5 K he is a little bit too cheap. Um, but I'm not loving that. He's the chalk. Uh, if he's going to be the chalky spend, there's like three other guys on the slate that are worth paying up for that. I really, really like. And when you factor in ownership, Jason Tatum is going to rank, you know, fourth on that list for me. So it is what it is. If chalky Jason Tatum goes nuclear and, and breaks the slate and the other guys I pay for don't do well and I lose because of that reason, I'm willing to take that risk. So if you want to play Tatum, you can. I don't think I'm going to play him with that ownership. I would much rather play Jalen Brown at 7.7K. It's a, it's a decent leverage play. He has an okay projection at 40 fantasy points. Okay boom rating at 22%. Uh, similar matchup, obviously, and he's coming at a little bit less ownership at 36%. So you know, I don't want to fade every Boston player here just because of ownership, but they are coming in pretty chalky. Obviously, uh, they are gonna, they're favored, and they are expected to do pretty well and win the game, so that, that makes sense. Um, I just think the savings with Jalen Brown and a little bit less ownership makes sense here, so he's a better play in my opinion. Derek White, I said, you know, after two – or he had like three really good games in a row, I said these kind of things, as good as you can be, are not very sustainable, so you need to start leveraging that by playing guys at a similar price point or paying up or down and just like getting your lineups different and getting away from like this Uber chalk as inviting as it might be, it eventually is going to bust. So Derek White has busted the last two games. Um, I still think he's a good price. And with his ownership at 38%, um, you know, it's not quite as high as it had been. So I'm okay with going to Derek White at six and a half K, especially if you don't like anybody else in that price range. And even more, especially if Drew Holiday is going to continue to be chalky. Another thing I had said the last time I talked about Boston was that Drew Holiday chalk doesn't feel like good chalk to me at all. So over the weekend, obviously, he had a big game, 38 fantasy points, um, which is great. I would have faded that chalk, and I did. It didn't work out in my favor. That's that's very true. But if you look back at this series and just who he's been in the playoffs, the dude had topped 30 fantasy points one time once in this playoffs until that point. So the minutes are there. Uh, obviously, Porzingis is out, so that benefits everybody in Boston. But Drew Holiday is just not a high-usage guy uh, in this offense right now. He took 10 shots and made seven of them in his last game, and that had a lot to do with how he performed. Uh, he's going to need to be uber-efficient, and I don't want to bank on that at 46% ownership. So the price is nice at 5.6. I think we can go and get other value and leverage the field right away if they're going to be eating that nasty Drew Holiday chalk. Love Drew Holiday as a Bucks fan, but I don't want to play him tonight. Um, I will eat the Al Horford chalk. He wasn't good in 39 minutes in his last game. Only uh, 17 fantasy points, I believe. Um, but I don't give a shit. That's recency bias big time. And 39 minutes is 39 minutes. 
no Porzingis. They need him if the game stays close. Um, so sign me up all day for L Horford at 5.4, even if he's washed. Dude can hit threes, can get blocks, rebounds, a little bit of inside scoring if they need it. I mean, he can do a little bit of everything. So 40% ownership with a 26-point fancy projection at 5.4K, I will eat that truck because I like the price and I like the minutes. Peyton Pritchard at 4K is probably the only other guy in Boston that I'm seriously considering. Uh, let's just double-check his minutes, how he's been doing. 20-plus in every game in this series and 20-plus in most of the playoff games he's played. He did not perform in his last game 13 fantasy points. So maybe a recency bias is lowering his ownership down to 21.5% at DFS Hero. That sounds good to me. If people are going to be not super into Peyton Pritchard at 4K, I'm going to go right back to him. Uh, you get 21 or 20 plus minutes for a guy who averages 0.78 fantasy points per minute. Obviously not elite, but um, he's been showing up in the playoffs. And uh, just there's not a lot of like really, really fun value. I mean, we're looking at fucking Aaron Wiggins over here, okay? We're looking at Isaiah Joe. So if those guys are going to carry ownership at all, give me Peyton Pritchard for sure. Um, worth noting that Luke Cornett was – I mean, he's probable actually he's fine so he's banged up a little bit so you could look at a different big you could look at sam hauser uh 3.4k but he's only getting like 10 minutes you could look at xavier tillman if they're gonna give him minutes he had 11 minutes um in the last game i think that was the last game yeah so if he was like randomly out you could look at xavier tillman as like a punt at 3k flat uh but i don't want to do that um, so yeah, quick recap for the Boston side. Tatum's fine, but I'm going to fade at that ownership. Drew Holiday is cheap, but I'm going to fade at that ownership. The guys I'm really looking to, if I want to eat some Boston chalk, are Horphy. That's my number one play for the Celtics. Then I like Derek White just because of the price. Then Jalen Brown. And then I can come back down for value to Peyton Pritchard if I feel like I really, really need him. All right, over to Cleveland we go. Obviously, the big news would be doubly, actually. We got Jared Allen still questionable. He hasn't played since the Orlando series. Uh, and Donovan Mitchell is also questionable. Donovan Mitchell, though, played 43 minutes in the last game. He played really well. He's been on fire. Obviously, it's a huge game. Um, so I expect him to play. I'm not really that concerned about it. If Donovan Mitchell misses, that would be massive. Uh, Cleveland would probably get completely housed. But if he's out, you could look at Karis LeVert as just uh, – Totally locked in play. Darius Garland will look amazing at 6.2K. Max Struess would be more viable than usual at 4.9. And maybe we could even start feeling a lot better about Isaac Okoro at 3.8K. And maybe we can even dust off Sam Merrill at 3.1K and take a punt there. I don't think he's going to miss, though. So I don't think we need to deal with all that crap. Um, so Donovan Mitchell at 9.K comes in with a 45-point fancy projection at DFS Hero. 23% boom rating. Obviously, Boston remains a difficult matchup. But Donovan Mitchell has not had many issues in this in this spot at all. So three games in, he has scored 21-plus real points in every game. <clears throat> He's had 50-plus fantasy points in every game, and he has had 50-plus fantasy points in five straight playoff games. Donovan Mitchell is officially dialed in, people. So I'm not worried whatsoever about Mitchell, assuming he is at full strength and can go. Um, so, yeah, if you want to pay for him a 9K and make him your stud, I definitely prefer him over Tatum just because the ownership play. He's about half his own as Tatum right now. So if that sticks, Mitchell over Tatum all day for me. Um, if Jared Allen is in and, like, not limited at 6.8K, that feels like a smash play. He's only 9% owned right now because he's probably not going to play. So uh, if he's in, like him quite a bit, uh, as long as he's not limited. If he's out, Evan Mobley looks awesome at 7.4K. Last time I vouched for Evan Mobley – he came at 10% ownership. I think officially it ended up at like 18% where I used him, and he smashed for 49 fantasy points. Uh, so obviously he benefits immensely from Jared Allen being out. If Allen is indeed out again, that is way too cheap, and his ownership at 20% is not enough. So I really like Evan Mobley, uh, assuming Jared Allen is out. I think he's fine if Jared Allen is in, especially if he ends up being limited. Um, but I'm expecting Jared Allen to miss at this point, so Mobley looks like an awesome play. Uh, Darius Garland remains, um, well, he remains viable. He, he remains viable, Chalk. He has not really hit. He's been a good price, and he's been in play for basically this entire series, basically all the playoffs, um, and he's only actually crushed once. He's had 40-plus fantasy points one time during the entire playoffs. He's just not really a high-usage guy. He hasn't been very efficient as a shooter, not really getting the assists that we're accustomed to seeing. Um, so... I think he's fine. He's just a decent mid-range guy at 6.2K. His price has come down a little bit. 
actually it was 6.1 last game, but it came down from the last slate that I broke down with him. Um, he's been getting right around 28 to 31 fantasy points in like every game. And in this series, that's like right where you're expecting him to be. So could he drop in a ceiling game and make me look a little bit silly? Sure. And at 20% ownership, I'm totally fine with Tate, you know, rolling the dice there. Um, yeah, he's just a fine play, but it's Drew Holiday hauling, uh, hounding him. I'm not like super excited to play Darius Garland whatsoever. He just has not been there. It's been the Donovan Mitchell show, and basically nobody else has shown up for cat for the Cavs. So totally fine play. If he gets up to being chalk, I'm very, very comfortable fading him. And he's just not a super, super um inviting play. Worth knowing, though, know, he does show up in the optimal lineup 39% of the time. That is leading the Cavs. Actually, he's tied with Karis LeVert for that. So um Definitely in play, just not something I'm very excited about playing. Max Struess's price has come way down. He's 4.9K. That is pretty cool considering the guy plays 35-plus minutes a game. He has not been hitting his shots at all, really, for most of the playoffs, and definitely not in this series. He has scored double figures one time in three outings. Uh, Eventually, that's going to change. I don't like that he's like 30% owned, but I do like the price, and I do think, I mean, he's going to keep letting it fly from long range, and eventually he's going to hit like four or five threes in a game and pay off. So I have no problem playing Struis at 4-9 if that's what you want to do, especially since Karis LeVert is coming in at major chalk at 48%, one of the chalkiest plays on the board. Um, Karis LeVert's obviously a better player. He does a lot more when he's out there. He's a better permanent guy. Um, But he's chalky. And um, we just never know what we're going to get out of Karis LeVert. Uh, so far in this series, he's at 19, 31, and 24 fantasy points. Does that feel like a guy you absolutely need to go pay for uh, or go put it put in your lineups when he's 48% owned? I don't think so. I think I'm um, two-game slate at 4.6K for a guy who's going to get pushing 30 minutes. He looks pretty good, and it looks like good chalk. So I don't mind playing him at all, but you could definitely leverage him with Struis and feel reasonably good about it because they're basically the same price. And they have basically the same projection. And Struess is, you know, 18% less owned. So certainly worth noting. Um, you can play them together. I probably wouldn't. Um, and I guess right now my lean, if I'm just looking at just logically who's the better play, I think it is Levert. I just don't like eating that much chalk on, on a guy that comes off the bench that is just you know, not, he's not offering much of a ceiling to begin with. So totally fine. I'll probably end up eating that chalk, but that's just where my head is at for value. Isaac Okoro is still getting minutes. So 3.8 K and he's going to get 18, maybe 20 plus minutes. If things break, right. You can go there at 3.8 K, but he's not a good per minute guy anyways. So he needs to come out and like hit every shot for him to really work out. So you can do it, but I'm not super interested in it. Quick recap for the cap side. Love Spida. Love Evan Mobley. I'm okay with going to Garland, Struess, or Levert. But as far as ownership goes, I'm also okay getting away from them if it gets out of control. Um, okay, so to the Thunder Mavs we go. The Thunder are on the road against Dallas. Mavs are up 2-1 in the series. Thunder are one-point dogs on the road here. This game is a 215 total. So when you look at spread, when you look at pace, when you look at defenses, and you look at to- game total, everything grades out well for this game. This is the better DFS environment for sure. Obviously, that can go the opposite way anytime. Uh, but if you're going to stack a game, you're going to get a lot of pieces from one game. This would be the game to do it. Uh, so right off the right off the bat, uh, SGA looks awesome. He's been crushing. Uh, we definitely can't ignore him just because his price is elevated. I mean, to be frank, his price is just now coming around where it was during the regular season. He's now 9.8K. He's pushing for a 55-point fantasy projection. He has topped that in each of his last three games. And in the last two games, he's topped 64 fantasy points both times. So he is a good play coming in at 42% of the optimal 37% boom rating. And he is very chalky at 47%. Look, feels like good chalk to me just because he's like one of the best studs of the slate. Um, I think SGA is going to, it's just going to come down to, do you want to play Tatum and do, or, and, or do you want to play for, or pay for Luca? So if you want Luca, I don't know if you can cram in SGA at almost 10 K. You're going to have to eat a lot of value. And on a two game slate, I don't think that's going to go well. I think that's stretching yourself a bit too thin with your build. Uh, but he looks great. If you want to pay and eat the truck, I have no problem with it. Uh, Jalen Williams looks really good at 7.5 K. He's not really busted out in this series yet, but he's certainly capable. He's just, decent right now i think i think because at that price point i would look for 
just cheaper guys who can maybe get you the production he's been getting us. So in this series so far, in three games, he's averaging about 35 fantasy points a game. And he's not top 36 fantasy points yet. So he had a lot better luck going uh, in the Pell series where he had below 36 fantasy points zero times and uh, under 37 fantasy points one time. So um, it just surprisingly, it hasn't gone that well for him here. Uh, he's actually been fairly efficient. He just isn't doing enough. Uh, and SGA is kind of the guy crushing for OKC. So he's a fine play. He's only 22% owned. I like that. I like the salary. The projection's okay. The matchup is good. The ownership is good. Only an 18% boom rating. And the price is a little bit higher than I'd like given the recent production and some of the other plays out there. So one of the first plays that stands out as a leverage on him, <clears throat> really uh, leverage on the salary, not really the ownership, would be Chet Holmgren. So his teammate is $600 cheaper. So right away, I like that. Um, Chet has been about the same in three games here, two times he's had 37 plus fantasy points and all three times he's at 30 plus. And I think one of those games was a blowout. Um, so Chet, I feel like Chet is just the better play. He's coming in at 28% ownership. So 6% more owned. That makes sense to me. Similar projection, way cheaper, way better boom rating. Uh, so yeah, I think if you're looking at those two guys, both are playable, uh, and Jalen will be a little bit less owned but I prefer Chet by quite a bit. Dort continues to look good as that 3 and D guy who's just going to get a shit ton of minutes as he tries to hound, uh, you know, Luca. Uh, he got 40 minutes last game, only 19 fantasy points. I mean, that's what you're really – you're paying for the minutes. He's going to be out there as much as he can despite foul trouble. Played 40 minutes and then fouled out. So <clears throat> they're going to play him until he fouls out, basically. Um he needs to hit shots to pay off, but a 4.8K, I think you can take that risk just because he's going to be out there for, like, the entire game. Of course, he has been in foul trouble every game of the series because he's, you know, tasked with slowing down the best player in the NBA, in my opinion, at least uh, the best, most complete, you know, scorer. Um, so that's, yeah, that could lead to an early exit or just him coming out, you know, in, like, you know, patches. So Aaron Wiggins and Isaiah Joe both are viable punts at 3.9 and 3.5K. Aaron Wiggins has actually been getting 20-plus minutes. So like I said earlier, um, we can make a pivot there to like Peyton Pritchard if Aaron Wiggins ends up being super chalky. Right now he's at 18%. So actually right now I prefer Aaron Wiggins over Peyton Pritchard because um, he's $100 cheaper and he's really not that owned. Um, but if that shifts, I would go the other way perhaps. But yeah, Aaron Wiggins, it's, it doesn't feel good saying it but josh giddy has lost minutes in the series he's played what 10 and 11 minutes 10, 11 and 13 minutes in the last two games he hasn't topped 17 minutes in, in this entire series so i don't know what that's all about but they don't want to play him in the series right now and andrew wiggins is getting run so i like wiggins a little bit doesn't feel good feels gross but he looks viable isaiah joe could be a leverage play there, depending on how ownership shakes up. He's four hundred dollars cheaper. That's kind of the really the leverage is the salary, and then maybe it frees you up to go get another stud or something. I don't know, but um, probably prefer Aaron Wiggins here. <coughs> and I'm not going to do the dance with the devil. I'm not doing Giddy four point seven K for a guy who's getting ten minutes. Not cool. I don't like that at all. Quick recap for OKC: SGA is a totally fine play if you don't mind eating the chalk. Jalen and Chet are both very viable and will not be very owned. I prefer Chet by quite a bit. And I really like Lou Dort as a solid value of 4.8K. And I'm okay with Aaron Wiggins, too. All right, last team here. We got Dallas at home. They are mild, mild, mild home favorites. Um, they're up in the series. They've been playing really well the last couple of games. Luca still has not exhibited the ceiling that we want to see out of him. He has not topped 63 fantasy points in this entire playoff run. Yeah. Even though he's getting monster minutes, he just has not been that dude. He's not been very efficient. He also hasn't been 100%. So if Luka's not healthy in a not-so-great matchup with OKC and he has not exhibited that ceiling, I do understand the argument for not paying for him. The problem for me is he does have the best projection of the slate. We know what ceiling he does have. And he's coming at 18% ownership. So that's tough to get away from. Um, so for me personally, when if Luca's going to be that low owned, I'm just going to lock in Luca and see how my build goes, you know? Like if Tatum and SGA are going to be monster chalk and Luca's going to be barely 19% owned, give me Luca. I'll take that chance. Um, 
like I said, those other guys are fine plays. You save money, but there is pretty good value on this slate. So I love Luke at 18%. Um, 35% boom running, top projection of the slate. He's expensive, but his price has come down to 11.2K. So he's only like a thousand more than SGA basically at this point. I don't I don't mind it at all. I love that ownership right now. Kyrie is fine. His price is coming down to 8.3K. He's not really smashed in this series. Yeah, literally hasn't topped 42 fantasy points yet in this series. So he's still going to defer to Luka. And they've get, been getting some monster games out of PJ Washington. I just he's fine at 8.3k. He's fine carrying 24% ownership, not super owned. I think you can do that. So before, um, before PJ Washington busted out again for the second game in a row, I actually was all over him on the previous slate, and hopefully you benefited from that. He was like 5.6k, and I've been saying he's he keeps getting minutes in the playoffs. And eventually he's going to do, you know, he's going to show up. He's going to get a double-double or he's going to have a big scoring game because it's what he does. He's done it two games in a row, 58 fantasy points with 29 real points. Two games ago, last game at 27 real points and 40 fantasy points. 40 minutes in both games. So I like P.J. Washington. He's only 6K. He plays a ton of minutes. He has a ceiling. But he's coming in at 45% owned. Do you have to fade P.J. Washington just to get leverage on the field? No, there's other places to do that. I probably will, though, because P.J. Washington, while he is all the things I just said and have been saying, he also is really inconsistent, and it's still not a great matchup. So is he going to shoot like 50, 55% <coughs> every game? No, of course not. So, um, yeah, it's 6K with the ownership spiking crazy. I'm very much okay with uh, making a different move there. Um, one e quick easy one on the same team is Daniel Gaffrey. He's only carrying 17% ownership. Him and Derek Lively flipped the minutes in the last game, so recency bias. People are, are going to go away from Daniel Gafford with his price elevated. I'm fine with playing Daniel Gafford there. Um, his projection is not that far away from PJ. You save $500, and you get major leverage in the ownership department. Derek Jones Jr. is the value on Dallas that I do not mind eating if he gets chalky. Right now he's at 22%. Um, he's 4.4K. He had 36 minutes last game. He's going to get 30-plus minutes as long as he stays out of foul trouble. So I like him quite a bit. I think Lively is fine. If he's going to be, like, unowned, you can leverage the Gafford ownership quite a bit or just, like, just in general. If anybody's going to play Gafford, you can go save 1.3K and play Lively if you want to. I just think Gafford's the better play and – I think recency bias is going to keep his ownership in check. Uh, let's see. How are the other guys faring? Josh Green at 3.3K, about 15 minutes off the bench. Nah. 3.7K for Tim Hardaway Jr., same deal there. So these guys are carrying about 15% ownership each. It's really going to be coming down to Tim Hardaway Jr., Josh Green, Peyton Pritchard, and, uh, and Aaron Wiggins. So you can use any of those guys. Um, and they're not coming in at like crazy ownership, so I'm fine with any of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think Wiggins would probably be my top value punt right now. Uh, and then maybe Pritchard. So I would probably go to the Mavs guys the last, just because they're basically splitting the little bit of extra minutes that they're giving to the bench guys here. And it's just not, it's not, it's not really, uh, it's not really inviting. So to recap the Mavs, love Luke at this ownership. That's how I'm starting my builds tonight. Uh, he's not necessarily the optimal play. He's coming in at 31% in the optimal lineup. Um, but you need to get away from that a little bit. You need to pick your spot. So I think if Luke is going to be that low owned, I can start right from the top. I can go get my optimal lineups uh, and then make the major switch, which would be going to Luka and not playing Tatum and or SGA. So we'll see how it shakes out, but I think that's the first big move I'd make. Another big move I'd make is leverage a, a, the other ownership ownership by uh, fading or going underweight on P.J. Washington and Drew Holiday if they're going to be mega chalky. So those are my two major moves. Uh, well, three major moves on this slate would be playing Luka and fading or going underweight on both Drew and P.J. who are carrying monster ownership. Beyond that, I'm okay with eating like all the other chalk. As I've discussed, I think a, a lot of the other chalk looks really good. If you're not fully on board with fading PJ or Drew, it's okay. You can play them. I just probably wouldn't play both. At some point, you need to make a call. Uh, whether you're playing a lot of lineups and you go underweight on certain plays 
or you're playing just a single entry, you just need to make a call to fade some of this chalk and and make a advantageous move to gain monster leverage. So um, playing Luca in the hammer game at 18% feels like a really good way to do that. Could you just stop there and kind of like e-thrust the chalk? I think you could, but I do also think that the field's going to adapt. And if they adapt, he's already 18%. It could inflate to like 30%, 40%, especially in a single entry. It could. Um, and then suddenly you're stuck with a relatively chalky Luca, and not enough different difference in your lineup. So um, that's that's what I would suggest doing. All right, real quick, let's just run the one optimal here that they are pushing out. Uh, yeah, and they're, <clears throat> they got Drew, Derek White, Jalen, Horford, Chet, SGA, Aaron Wiggins, Derek Lively. And as I said, I'm okay with Derek White. I like Jalen just fine. Love the Horford chalk. Love Chet as a pivot off of uh, Jalen. Uh, totally fine with SGA. But SGA and Jalen is probably where I would go different and go Luca at the guard spot and then Peyton Town at small forward. Totally fine with Aaron Wiggins' value. And Lively is okay, uh, especially if he is going to be low-owned. <clears throat> he is coming in the optimal 45% of the time, so worth noting. This is not the lineup I'm using, uh, but it's also really early in the day, so things are going to change. Ownership, maybe we get some random injury news. Maybe Donovan Mitchell doesn't play, and that just like screws everything up. I don't know. But hopefully I helped you out. Hopefully this breakdown leads you down a winning path. If I helped you out anyway, please give this video a like and also consider subscribing to the channel. Helps us out quite a bit. I hope you win tonight. Thanks for watching. Good luck.